My talk is entitled Valedictory for Robert N. Macaulay. <laughs> now, this is not a funeral. <laughs> I had to look up the word valedictory because I'm, I'm in, in American high schools, there's a, a valedictory speech or something like that. But it, in where I came from, there wasn't such a thing. So I had to learn it. So a valedictory, in a sense, is saying farewell. Now, I don't think Bob's moving anywhere, so it's going to be an interesting thing to work this out. Anyway, I was asked to say some nice things about Bob. Now, he's already had many nice things to say about him today, so in a sense, this is carrying coals to Newcastle. Okay, I met Bob McCauley 50 years ago. That's a long time, folks, older than Justin Barrett. Bob was looking for an evening class because of his athletic obligations during the day. And I happened to be teaching a class in the evening on religion and rationality, using the now classical set of essays edited by Brian Wilson titled Rationality. Bob had come to Western Michigan University on an athletic scholarship and was busy in the afternoon throwing the hammer and doing all kinds of exercises associated with this strange sport. But he had needed an evening class in order to complete his class schedule. What really became clear in our class was that he might have been able to throw the hammer great distances with impeccable style, and I must add, already many theories about the optimal techniques to do the job, but he was actually adept at rigorous intellectual conversation and disciplined inquiry. Bob became a welcome addition to our class, and he has reminded me since I arrived here that once I poked him in the chest and said, you are going to graduate school. <laughs> Our encounter in that class in 1973 led to a series of independent studies with me on many topics, most of them having to do with concepts and issues in philosophy. Because of Bob's deep interest in philosophy, and especially the philosophy of science, I took him to his first philosophy of science meeting in 1974 at the University of Notre Dame, just down the road from WMU. Both Carl Hempel and Richard Rudner made presentations at that meeting and issues about what counts as knowledge and specifically scientific knowledge was front and center at the meeting. In this intellectual environment, Bob was clearly in his element. Papers can get uh, pretty esoteric at philosophy of science meetings. Uh, and I can remember both Bob in a lecture on the philosophy of science and physics uh, asking him, did you understand that? <laughs> Bob said, of course, and proceeded to lay out clearly what he had just heard and what it meant. Quite intimidating to his professor. What a gifted students I had the pleasure of getting to know in those early days. He graduated summa cum laude in 1974 and had the process of his studies, and in the process of his studies, had accumulated many awards. For example, the George Sprout Prize for Outstanding English Major, the Cornelius Lowe Award for the Study of Religion Major, the Mid-American Conference Scholar uh, Athlete of, the, of 1974, the Western Michigan University Scholar Athlete of 1974, the Mitchell Gary Scholar Athletic Award of 1973 and 1974, the Waldo Sangren Academic Scholarship Award and the University Scholarship in 1971, 1972, 1973, and 1974. With his undergraduate work complete, it is important to note that Bob had not lost his interest in religion, 
despite his love of philosophy. And so he applied to the Divinity School and was admitted to the Divinity School of the University of Chicago, from which he received an MA in the History of Religions. With an MA in the History of Religions under his belt, he transferred to the exciting home of philosophy at the University of Chicago, where he would meet and befriend such stellar scholars as Alan Donegan. I met Alan Donegan a few years after that, and he told me that Bob was one of the brightest students he'd ever met. Uh, Alan uh, Donegan, uh, among the fellow, uh, among the fellow gr graduate students, he would build lifelong friendships with philosophers such as Bill Bechtel and Mark Johnson, both of whom became eminent cognitive scientists. On admission to the University of Chicago, Bob had been granted, granted the prestigious Danforth Graduate Fellowship, a five-year fellowship that provided a secure system of support in enabling him to focus on his studies. He also was granted the Miss, Mrs. Guy, uh, Giles or Giles Whiting Foundation dissertation uh, in order to work on his dissertation. He graduated with a PhD with departmental honors in 1979 and was ready to face the world, which meant finding a job and starting to write with the goal of publication. He did not delay. His first publication was in the journal, The Philosophy of Science in 1981, pretty fast. His first appointment was at Indiana University the position he held from 1979 to 1983, and where he served with distinction under the leadership of Adolf Johansson, who also became a great friend. I kept in close touch, touch with Bob and Dridney during these early years and visited him once in a while, avoiding those times when he was cheering on the races at the Indiana 500. Indiana University was also the place where he, we began the very early stages of writing together. Writing with Bob can be an exciting and exacting, exacting experience. When you have a, a, a line on the bottom of the page and want to move to the next page, he won't let you until the last word on that page is exactly what it should be. If necessary, call up the thesaurus. One, uh, one project in particular that we were working on was a theory of ritual structure that eventually became chapter five in Rethinking Religion. And I think might have been the beginning of the idea of the cognitive science of religion. Of course, after that, we wrote a great deal together with essays such as Who Owns Culture and books such as Bringing Ritual to Mind. Both also, Bob also collaborated with a number of cognitive scientists, some of whom are in this room. After Indiana University, Bob spent the year of 1982-83 as adjunct professor of philosophy at Purdue University, while Drindy was completing her PhD. This gave him the opportunity, guess what, to study statistics, among other things. In 1983, he was appointed assistant professor of philosophy at Emory University, and the rest, as they say, is history. Emory liked him, and he liked Emory, a perfect match. I have been studying Bob's 36-page CV and both his productivity and his leadership positions are simply astonishing. Seven books, at least 70 articles and chapters, and chapters, another 40 publications of various types, many blogs in psychology today, and of course the Gifford 
bicentennial, uh, bicentennial lecture entitled Religion and Their Cognitive King. Kin, which for your in information is available on the web and worth paying close attention to. His productivity has been recognized by his appointment as the William Rand Kennan Jr. University Professor and earlier the Massey Martin Distinguished Teaching Professor of Philosophy. Outside the university, his productivity was also recognized, for example, as president of the Society for, the, for Philosophy and Psychology and as president of the International Association for the Cognitive and Evolutionary Sciences of Religion. Bob has always been committed to excellence in teaching, and he has received a number of honors and awards for bringing that excellence to the classroom. For example, the Phi Beta Kappa Award for Excellent in Teaching, which he has received many times. I can remember talking to a student who was visiting us at the Institute of Cognition and Culture uh, at Queen's University in Belfast, uh, whom I recognized had graduated from Emory. I asked him if he knew Bob, and he said that he did know Bob, and then said, Bob Macaulay is a phenomenon. Uh, Mitch Hodge, a graduate student at the Institute of Cognition and Culture at Queen's University, Belfast, and who had studied under Charles Nussbaum, who had studied under Bob, loved to talk about his links to Bob through Charles. Actually, Bob ended up serving as a member of Mitch's committee at Q UB. It should not be surprising that he has been invited to deliver many keynote addresses and lectures throughout the United States, the UK and Europe. But he not only talks, uh, he also listens. By that he mean he uh, by that I mean he loves music and listens to it both at home and in orchestral halls. He and Rindy also love the theater. They have attended the Shaw and Shakespeare Festival numerous times. As founding director of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture, he has established a context for significant communication among a number of disciplines. This, uh, this conference is an excellent, excellent example of that interdiscipline, interdisciplinarity. There is little doubt that Bob is a truly interdisciplinary thinker with deep roots in cognitive anthropology, cognitive and evolutionary psychology, and evolutionary biology, as well as the philosophy of science. And let's not forget comparative religion. Both might have, Bob might have retired from an academic position but he has not retired from the world of scholarship. As an emeritus, he has much work ahead of him. In the years ahead, we look forward to what Bob will write. We expect nothing but excellence from this wonderful man. May this farewell turn into many hellos. Thank you.